All right, let's speak about The Voice, Mr Howard. We're on the eve of the referendum for The Voice to Parliament. Anthony Albanese will tomorrow announce the date. What's your message to Australians at the start of this campaign? Well, the campaign's been going for a while, but my message is um, if you are intending to vote no, uh, hold hard to that intention. Don't be blinded by an avalanche of publicity. There's a lot of talk that the ESK case has millions of dollars. Well, I think Clive Palmer sent, spent tens of millions of dollars with very little result. Australians are very hard-headed when it comes to politics. We have what I've always recognised as a, a deep deposit of Celtic scepticism when we look at uh, the blandishments of uh, political figures of whatever stripe. Uh, I think the case for voting yes is very weak. And what I find quite extraordinary is that um, the Prime Minister and his colleagues are sort of almost boasting about the fact that they haven't explained it. I'm against the voice proposal for three reasons. The first is that I don't like anything that divides us according to race. And however you slice and dice it, it does do that. It, it does create a body that will be inevitably composed of Indigenous people and the, the electorate for that body will be composed of Indigenous Australians. We don't know how they'll be elected, though. Big pun? We don't know how they'll be chosen, that body. We don't know body. how they're going to be elected. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> I've often thought of a speech I heard Bob Hawke make in 1988 when he said, the only thing that defined you as an Australian was your commitment to Australia. No matter where you came from, whether you were Anglo-Celtic, you were Italian, Greek, Christian, Jewish, atheist, whatever, didn't matter. Uh, you were defined by your commitment to Australia, and that's how it should be. Yet this proposal defies that, defies uh, the declaration of the person I regard as the most successful Labor, and I stress the adjective, <laughs> Prime Minister that Australia's had. Mm, mm. Now that's the first reason I object to it. The second reason I object to it is that I fear that in the hands of an activist High Court, and bear in mind that only three years ago the High Court of Australia decided that an Indigenous person could never be categorised as an alien even though that person was born in another country, owed allegiance to another country, mm. and in every other respect was an alien. That worries me. It ought to worry other people who fear for an activist court. And, and I think the final reason uh, is that whatever the government might say in the next six weeks, the truth is that any pronouncement of this body will have a coercive effect on the government of the day and if this body proposes something that the government doesn't like, every man and his dog to use an Australianism mm. will be yelling at the government to do what they're told because this, after all, is the body which represents Indigenous people. Mm. And you've gone through all this trouble mm. to insert it in the Constitution and now you're going to ignore their advice. Mm. How can you possibly do that? And that is how politics can work in this country. We've seen debate over whether the Uluru Statement from the Heart is one page or 18 to 26 pages. Anthony Albanese uh, says the suggestion that it's more than one page is a conspiracy. Uh, we've seen ABC journalist Lee Sales give advice to the ABC uh, that it would be misinformation for anyone to say it's more than one page. Uh, my colleague Peter Credlin was censored for her view that it runs to 26 pages. What do you think about all of this? Well, I think that just illustrates the extraordinary muddle mm. that the government's got itself into. I mean, there are countless instances of the Prime Minister saying that he's in favour of uh, having uh, a voice, a treaty, and uh, you know, truth-telling. Uh, now, now, that's the essence of the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And I don't think there'll be too much talk about one page versus 26 pages mm. if the voice gets up. Uh, there'll be plenty of people who are saying the next thing is a treaty. Mm. Now, I think 
of all the absurdities coming out of this debate, there is nothing more absurd than the notion of making a treaty with the indigenous. How can you make a treaty with yourself? Treaties are made between sovereign nations. We have treaties with other countries. We don't have treaties with bits of ourselves. Mm. And it only has to be stated to be realised as a complete absurdity. We're seeing a lot of corporates and sporting codes come out and back the voice to Parliament, some of them running uh, strong campaigns. Qantas has patented yes on the side of mm. some of its planes. What's your view of this? Well, I think the Qantas example is probably the most um, <clears throat> egregious of all. Mm. Um, my view is that large companies should be neutral because they have a lot of employees, they have a lot of shareholders, mm. they have a lot of customers, and there's no way they can speak for them. And I did make you know, some personal representations for the, the leaders of two of the sporting bodies that I'm close to. And oh, did you? Yeah. I, I just simply said, you know, why don't you just stay neutral? Yes. And um, they said, oh, well, our, I think their governing bodies wanted to take a position, but how on earth could can a large sporting... Take a body like the AFL, mm. <clears throat> which is the largest football code by far in Australia. Well, they're not necessarily player-wise, but certainly spectator-wise. Mm. You know, they've taken a position. Does that mean that every single club is going to advocate ES vote? I know for a fact they won't. Mm. because I've spoken to people who are involved in the running of the individual clubs who quite resent the fact that uh, they're, you know, trying, there's an attempt being made to dragoon them into supporting it. I just think, as, as a lover of various sports, I just think it'd be a good idea if it's left to the individual. Mm. There's no way that a body like the AFL can know what their fans want. There's no way you, mm. Cricket Australia can know what their fans want or the NRL or Rugby Australia, and I just think it'd be better if they said nothing. Do you think there's a risk that it would have the opposite effect and well, people... Well, I, I think a lot of... I, people I would feel bullied into yeah, how yeah, to well, vote. People, people, yeah. Australians do not like being bullied. They do not like receiving condescending advice. We have this, as I said, this scepticism, you know, what are they up to? What do they want? That's the sort of reaction that you get, and I don't think that's going to help, but help the yes case. I hope it doesn't. Do you still think it's on track to fail, the referendum? Well, I can only take the advice of... Um, well, I can, no, I can only note what the polls are saying, and the polls are trending. Mm. But I've seen a lot of polls, and I think what's happened is it started off with a big lead. Yes. And as questions have arisen, that lead's whittled away. And, uh, but uh, I would, as somebody who wants it to be defeated and defeated resoundingly in every state, um, I, um, I would encourage no voters to um, maintain the rage, if I can <laughs> draw on a phrase that's well known in Australian politics. We, we spoke a moment ago about uh, Peter Credlin's mm. Sky News video on Facebook being censored, labelled false and misinformation mm. for her comments about the length of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which at the very least are contested, at the very least. Are, are you concerned there's too much censorship of free speech, uh, both in this debate, but also the Albanese government is pushing ahead with proposed misinformation legislation. Well, I think the idea of any government proposing a misinformation bill is absurd. I just think we should say... There are three things that maintain democracy in this country, mm. in my view, and if you've got them in a robust state, you don't need anything else. The first thing is that we have a very robust parliamentary system. It's got a lot of fault and it cops a lot of criticism but it, it's very effective. And secondly, we have an incorruptible judiciary. Nobody says our judges are crook. I mean, we disagree with some of their decisions and that's our right. But, gee, they've got a reputation for integrity. Yes. And, and, and the final thing is we have a free press. I mean, we criticise it and it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, I was made very uncomfortable by the free press on many occasions. 
when I was Prime Minister, but that's their job. If you've got those three things, you don't need anything. You don't need a Bill of Rights. You don't need governments saying, well, we're going to define what's disinformation and misinformation. Now, the Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, criticised you in private remarks last week at a Labor factional in dinner. In private remarks? Private <laughs> remarks that were leaked to the Sydney Morning Herald. Oh. Are, you, are you aware of this? She referred to your remarks in the early 1990s during the seminal land, land rights case mm. Marbo. Mm. Uh, she said that, um, you know, when you held up a map of Australia on the 7.30 report, Wong said that your arguments were exaggerated then. And then she said that fears about Marbo, the apology and the same-sex marriage haven't been realised. And she's saying the same would be the case for the voice to Parliament. Do you think you've been on the wrong side of history before? No, I, I don't think I've been on the wrong side of history. I, I remember that it was in relation to some land claims that have been made and I was referring to the fact that there were claims. I don't think there's anything particularly you know, odd about that. And mm. I voted no to same-sex marriage and I don't apologise for that. Why should I? So did it, in, it was a very imperfect plebiscite because the Labor Party wouldn't support an orthodox one, wouldn't have altered the result. Um, and as far as the apology is concerned, well, I had a reason for not giving the apology. I don't think you can apologise for the misdeeds of other people. You can regret that they happened, and I did that. But if... Um, I think apologies should be given by people who are um, responsible for the things they're apologising for. Mm. And I was being asked to apologise for the misdeeds of others. Now, I wasn't willing to do that. Mm. And a lot of people agreed with me, a lot didn't. Does that put me on the wrong side of history? Well, I'll leave it to the historians. And uh, uh, the Australian people didn't think that because they re-elected my government several times after I had declined to give the apology.